Hello, you're watching Global Insights, where we speak to experts from around the world on issues making headlines. I'm Wu Xiang. Now, 2022, it's been a big year for South Korea's diplomacy, from launching its global pivotal state vision, playing a greater role in strengthening the world's liberal democratic order and working closer with like-minded nations to address shared challenges. We look at some of the biggest issues with Professor Ramon Pacheco Pardo at King's College London, who's been a key advisor to the South Korean government and authored the book Shrimp to Well, South Korea from the Forgotten War to K-pop. We're very happy to welcome him back to our studio today. Hello, Professor Pacheco. Party. Thanks for joining us this morning. Hi, thanks for having me. Right. Um, well, uh, so this week, um, U.S. Secretary, Assistant Secretary of State uh, Daniel Crittenberg, uh, he's going to be visiting South Korea, Japan and China to mm. talk about uh, bilateral and regional issues, they say. And well, that's rather broad, but then we can probably assume that they're going to talk about North Korea. So uh, what kind of discussions do you think they're going to be having? Yes, I, I do think that they will have to focus on, on, on North Korea. Uh, I think the U.S. Uh, feels that the, its policies is clearly not, not working. Mm -hmm. So it will want to see uh, what they can do together with, with Korea, with, with Japan, but also with China, see if they can influence North Korea. But more broadly, I guess they would imagine what we see as a defrost in U.S.-China relations. We saw the recent meeting between President Biden and uh, Xi Jinping, President Xi Jinping. So, I think there will be a discussion as well about how we can move forward in a relationship that is more constructive between uh, the US and China and, and where do Korea and Japan stand in this uh, antagonism between the two of them. I, I see and well uh, we saw North Korea just acting up throughout the whole year. They shot more than 60 missiles mm -hmm. apparently uh, throughout 2020, 2022 rather and um, well what do you think really explains their co constant provocations? I think there are two, two main reasons. One of them, trying to improve their capabilities, uh, trying to make sure that they can keep up with what North Korea thinks are more advanced South Korean capabilities and, of course, American capabilities as well. And, and I think also North Korea is trying to send the message that uh, whenever uh, South Korea and uh, the U.S. engage in their uh, joint military exercises and the military buildups in, in the region, that it wants to keep up, that it doesn't want to feel the third uh, by South Korea and, and alliance with the U.S. So I think there's also this uh, component as well that is quite important for the North Korean regime. Right, sure. And uh, well, another issue that could be discussed by Seoul and Washington in particular, maybe Japan as well, is the um, Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, South Korea, European countries, they've been very angry about um, you know, the U.S. really limiting its uh, tax credits to electric vehicles that were only produced within Northern America. Of course, that's a move that's widely called discrimin discriminatory. And well, what kind of solution or settlement do you think Seoul and Brussels are looking for? It's a very big issue in Europe, uh, definitely, as much as it is here in Korea and, as you say, also, also in Japan. Uh, I think what uh, Europe, uh, Korea are probably looking at is the possibility that, especially in the case of Korea, because it has the FTA with the US, right, that uh, those countries that have a strong economic but also political and security relationship with the US uh, that somehow will be covered by these uh, uh, tax uh, breaks, tax advantages, to producers within the U.S. In the case of Korea, obviously, uh, factories are being built uh, as we speak and, and they should open in a couple of years, for example, with uh, Hyundai, right? Uh, European car makers are looking at the same. So they may also look at those countries that are uh, companies that are investing in the U.S. to do it in the same way before they open their factories there. Uh, I don't think it's going to be easy, but I think a settlement probably will be reached because of political reasons. The U.S. wants to have a strong relations with Korea, with the EU, and also, of course, with, uh, with Japan as well. Right, of course, and we've seen for a couple of months now that uh, South Korea and European countries, they've both been really pushing the U.S. to revise its law, and now that the midterm elections are over, probably they want to see some kind of movement on that front. And Well, um, in terms of South Korea-EU relations, or, well, uh, well, NATO relations rather. South Korea set up its uh, official mission to Brussels um, last month in November. And well, what was the motivation behind that, do you think, on Seoul's side? I think there were two main reasons. Uh, first one, uh, NATO has been calling on, on, on Korea's uh, door, uh, Korea, Australia, New Zealand and, and, and Japan. And it wants to have uh, stronger relations uh, with them. And I think uh, on the Korean side, uh, the Korean government realized that uh, it was beneficial, it is beneficial to actually 
follow on this call from NATO to have a stronger relations. Uh, it's NATO, but of course the U.S. is part of NATO as well, so it also helps to strengthen relations with the U.S. within the NATO uh, framework. And I think secondly, the practical cooperation. Uh, NATO is focusing heavily on cybersecurity, is trying to strengthen its role in maritime security, is keeping an eye on, on, on China as well and its relationship with Russia. So from a practical uh, point of view, we see that it makes sense uh, for Korea to improve relations with NATO and also with NATO member states, for example, the arms to, to, to Poland. So, so I think there are practical reasons whereby Korea feels that it needs to improve relations with, with NATO and that's why it has opened the, the mission there. Right, and um, how do you think South Korea could really uh, benefit and uh, in what ways do you think it can really contribute to NATO as well? Cybersecurity is a big one. Uh, NATO wants to learn really from South Korea how it is to deal with uh, North Korea, uh, cyber attacks coming from North Korea. Of course, China and Russia as well, but North Korea is the big one from a NATO perspective when it comes to South Korea. Uh, but also, I think that uh, NATO is looking at the, uh, we're seeing these arms sales, uh, as I mentioned before, right, from, from, from Korea to NATO. Uh, members, uh, Poland being the, the, the big one. Uh, I think there is going to be this focus on uh, technological cooperation, this focus on practical military cooperation as well. And I think Korea can benefit uh, from this. It can expand its uh, market in Europe. Uh, it can also look at uh, technology that some European countries, plus the US obviously, uh, military technology that is very advanced that Korea can benefit from and, and vice versa obviously. Uh, European uh, countries can benefit from Korean military technology. So there are a host of areas in which there can be cooperation. And the other big one is obviously political support from NATO to uh, South Korea's position on North Korea, uh, because NATO can actually back up uh, the position of the current government uh, here in South Korea. Right, and you mentioned cybersecurity, and well, uh, South Korea faces cybersecurity attacks uh, from North Korea, a lot of threat from North Korea. And well, what can it really learn from uh, Ukraine's example, I suppose, uh, Russia's cyber attacks on Ukraine, for instance? I think the main lesson is that. Uh, these cyber attacks uh, can come uh, at any point in time. Uh, they can come from multiple sources. It could be, uh, we see in Europe, it could be the Russian military, but it could be private firms in, in Russia, so-called private firms that are working closely with the Kremlin. So obviously in the case of North Korea, there is no private sector to speak of, right? Uh, so, so there would be uh, the companies that are under the North Korean state, the military, the government itself, or it could be groups that actually don't operate from North Korea, but they operate from China, for example, linked to North Korea. That's a lesson that we have learned in Europe as well, that there are these groups that Russia has that are linked to other countries that are also launching cyber attacks, and also the sophistication of the attacks. There is the disinformation uh, campaigns being launched. There's also direct attacks on uh, European uh, military forces, for example. So there are multiple types of attacks that are taking place, and I think it's the same with North Korea when it launches uh, this type of uh, cyber activities on South Korea. Right, and well, that's actually one of the very few to topics you uh, discuss with South Korean officials here, I believe. And well, we wanted to have you on the program last month, but you were rather busy, actually. You were here in Seoul, though, uh, with uh, the Spanish mm -hmm. Prime Minister um, uh, during his um, trip here. And well, what were the outcomes of that? What was the purpose of that trip? I think the main purpose was economic uh, cooperation. Uh, Spain feels that there are Korean companies, Samsung for example, that may be interested in opening factories uh, in Spain or research and, and, and development centers and R&D as well. Uh, obviously there are also Spanish uh, exports to, to, to Korea, but in this case it was more about how Spain can benefit from, from, from Korean investment. So that was a, a very big one. Uh, he also, uh, Spanish Prime Minister Pedro Sánchez, he also opened the Cervantes Institute in, in, in Myeongdong. So there's going to be this cultural exchange as well. We're going to see more Spanish culture uh, coming here to, to Korea. But the other one was also security. Uh, Spain feels that when it comes to security, uh, Korea is a similar country in terms of size, in terms of military strength, in terms of size of the economy, uh, obviously in terms of values as well, uh, democracy very the, the big one. So, so there's this belief in Spain and other European countries that when it comes to security cooperation, cyber, maritime that I mentioned before, uh, but it could also be arms sales that we were talking about before, that Korea is a key partner, probably the key partner in Asia along with Japan. So therefore there is a need to strengthen security relations uh, with Korea. Right, and well, last year uh, the two countries agreed to upgrade their ties to strategic um, partnership. And what does that really mean? And uh, how do you see the two 
countries really um, cooperating together for economic security. So it, it really means going beyond trade and investment, right? So, for example, you mentioned economic security. That's very important. Uh, how can we, for example, engage in joint uh, technology uh, projects, right? Uh, semiconductors, for example, in the case of Korea, electric uh, batteries as well. But if you look at Spain, it's very strong, for example, in renewable energies, wind energy, which is uh, a big growth area here in Korea. So it's looking at these areas that, yes, of course, they're related to, 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 to economics per se, but they go beyond economics. It's reducing dependency, for example, on uh, oil and gas uh, coming from the Middle East or coming from, from, from Russia in the case of uh, Korea, but also in the case of uh, Spain and other European countries, uh, obviously. So, so that's, that's, that's crucial. And also the strategic partnership is looking, for example, at cooperation within the United Nations, cooperation within uh, the G20, where Spain is, is, is a guest country. Uh, so cooperation in these frameworks, multilateral frameworks, in which, again, Spain feels that is a very similar country to Korea, so therefore cooperation should be taking place. And the last big one, what I was mentioning before, security. So going beyond talking about security cooperation and doing when it comes to security cooperation. And, and that's uh, very important from a Spanish perspective. Right. And, uh I assume we'll be seeing uh, more of this, uh, not only just with Spain, but also um, the EU, uh, mm. uh, between EU and Korea. And um, that's one of the uh, big areas that you focus on, right? Mm. So will, will we see more of that next year? Yes, yes. Uh, maritime security is very important for, 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 for the EU and European countries, of course, uh, France, Germany, or Netherlands. Uh, and Korea, again, is the, the key partner really in this part of the world. Uh, as I mentioned before, is, is Korea, Japan, really the, the two big partners in, in, in Asia. Uh, there is also cyber security for the EU. Uh, it has, is looking at the strengthening links with, with Korea. And we saw the digital partnership that was signed, uh, announced uh, only last week, Monday, Monday of last week. And e even though it's a digital partnership, there's a strong cyber security uh, component as well. And, and there is another area for, for the EU that's becoming more and more prominent, which is working together with Korea and third countries, Southeast Asia, uh, India, for example. How can we improve the capabilities of these countries together, right? Uh, and that's another uh, big one for Europe. And increasingly, there is talk about uh, triangulation between uh, the European Union, the US, and Korea. Potentially also with Japan, some people talk about the new Quad, for example, right? right. And, and, and that's very important from a European perspective as well. Right, I see. Well, we look forward to um, hearing more from what's uh, developing in South Korea EU relations. And thank you very much for your time today. Thanks for having me. Thank you. That was Roman Pacheco Pardo, a professor of international relations at King's College London and KFVUB chair of the Brussels School of Governance. Thank you also to our viewers for tuning in. Global Insight will be back tomorrow at the same time here in South Korea. Wherever you are in the world, have a great day. Goodbye.